All right. So uh, I won't I, I won't rehash everything, but just to say that first we'll talk about the academic study of religion. Then we'll go over some more vocabulary. Third, some ideas about sacred spaces, some ideas within the theory of religion, uh, what how sacred spaces are created, what someone like Durkheim, how he defines religion and how that definition kind of has, has shaped the study of religion for us. Uh, same thing with Merche Eliade. And then I want to move into some examples of, well, actually one particular example about an altered state of consciousness with a particular Nepalese shaman. So we'll see if we can do this in, in just a few minutes, in half hour or so. Uh, so first things, um, when I teach religious studies, I have a, uh, why study religious studies? I'm not going to read this entire thing. If you take a class with me, then you'll be punished and you'll have to read it. But, you know, this is a, this is a student club. You shouldn't have to feel like you're in a class. But I want to show it to you because there's four things that I think are, are, are assumptions or misconceptions about what we do in the study of religion. I say think of it as the first 10 or 15 minutes. Um, we probably get through this in, in five, uh, unless you have questions, please. I'm going to stop for questions after I go through these. Because uh, this is a short title. What is religious studies and why does it matter? And you guys can't see it. Now you can. Um, online, they probably could see it. Now you can see it. The short title, What is Religious Studies and Why Does It Matter? The longer, the longer title is A Brief Lecture on Some Assumptions and Misconceptions on the Academic Study of Religion, otherwise known as Religious Studies, and How This is Different from the Personal Practice of Religion. Uh, as, as a side note, um, I've been talking about this stuff for probably close to 20 years. And when I applied for the job here eight years ago, they they said, can you talk about in your in your job interview, can you talk about the difference between the academic study of religion and the personal practice of religion? And at that point in my life, I'd been doing this for a very long time. I said, sure, that's that's what I that's what I talk about a lot, because a lot of people are, are have assumptions. And these are the four assumptions. I'll just go through them very quickly. You need to be religious to study religion. That means you have to believe in something. You have to have, you're studying religion so that you can become a better, insert religious uh, practice here. You can become a better Christian, a better Hindu, a better Jew. That's not what the academic study of religion is. By studying religion, we study human behaviors. Our goal is not to become a better adherent, but to actually understand what people do when they do religion. Assumption number two is studying religion will make you more religious. I'm going to go through these quickly. I'm not going to read every every point here, um, but I, I, I'll just go leave these four on there. Studying religion will make you more religious. Again, the goal here is not to become a better adherent, but to study and understand what people do when they do religion. So our goal is understanding, not necessarily belief or practice. Third, studying religion will make you less religious. This one, I know some academics who actually believe this, and it's a shame. Um, what they think is that once you study all the re world religions, you'll realize what a heap of junk it is, and you'll realize it's all fake, it's all phony, and none of it's real. That's sort of sad in a way, because I'll let you in on a little secret. A um, hundred years ago, within the academic study of religion, the, the major belief within science was that religion was going to fade away. It was going to go away. No one was going to believe in this stuff anymore in a hundred years. Well, guess what? People still do. In fact, people are more religious today than ever before in human history. Now, I know what you're thinking. You probably read something in the newspaper that said people aren't going to church. Okay, church membership is down. Or, and I'm not sure what kind of church they mean, but, but organized religion is down. That doesn't mean people aren't religious. That doesn't mean people aren't religious. That's an, another misconception that probably should be on here, but it's, it's embedded in that idea of studying religion will make you less religious. The fourth one here, 
that the study of religion is impractical is one that hurts my heart because I do this for a living. So, um, but but in all seriousness, a lot of people think that scholars study this stuff, academics study it. Why should I care? All right, I I know that for the Muslim, for the Hindu, for the Jew, for the Buddhist, when they do their thing, they're learning something for themselves. They take ownership of how to learn to meditate or, or how to do a particular practice. And that's good for them. And that's practical for them. But as an academic, I'm studying it. I'm not participating. I'm observing. I'm learning. I'm not learning how to meditate. I'm learning what people do when they meditate. How is that practical? Well, there's a lot of reasons why it's practical. I don't know if you've read anything about it in the news today, but there's UN council meetings in New York City. Every single one of these world leaders there has advisors to understand other cultures. When people from the United States, when politicians go, when business leaders go, when educators go to another part of the world, you can bet they want to learn about the people that they're going to engage with. That's a very practical and real thing, right? There's one point, what, 3 billion Indian people in, in, in the country of India right now? 1.2 billion Chinese people in the country of China right now um, makes up like, what, one seventh or one sixth of the world's population. It might be helpful to know how these people think, all right? What goes on in particular places in China, in India, in large countries in the world? It might help to communicate. I think... A lot of the strife, a lot of the wars in the world are caused by misunderstandings, possibly by religious misunderstandings. So that's my spiel. That's it for understanding these differences. Now, I'm going to scroll quickly to the bottom just because I like to say this. Studying what people do is fun and practical, too. And I say by this information in this course, but I say nothing makes a better world citizen than a wise citizen. Well, you guys are here. This is a student club. You guys are taking extra time. So I'm sure you understand the purposes of learning, of getting an awareness, of getting a cultural understanding. So I don't need to preach to the choir, so to speak. But what I want to do um, is ask you guys if you have any questions on those misconceptions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we're saying religion, um, what would you be the definition of that? Because I know there's because I know there's non-theistic religion, then I love it. I I heard the best definition of religion. Um I'm gonna go over one by uh, uh um a 1912 definition from Durkheim in in a few minutes here. But um last about a year and a half ago, I had a presenter from Cal State Chico come and give a talk about what is religious studies. And someone asked him the same question. He got kind of angry about it. Not, it seemed like he was angry. It seemed like he was, but I knew, I knew the guy and he was kind of being more sarcastic than anything else. He said, I don't know. And I don't care. And I said, you know what? That's actually not a bad answer because it depends who you ask. I mean, you're asking me, I have no idea what religion is. I don't know. Because as soon as we define it, something else can take over. Someone will say religion is what you do religiously. So they're trying to make a, a mind, uh, put a mindless element into it. They'll say, oh, no, I practice this, but that's not religion. I worship this, but that's not religion. Because they want to say religion has to be organized, has to be structured. It has to take place in a certain type of community. I'm not sure if that's the case. A definition that um, Emil Durkheim gives us, which we'll, we'll, I'm gonna work up to, but I'll give, give it to you now so that you can understand the academic definition that I think we all work under. This was written in 1912 and it still guides us today. A religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. That is to say, things set apart and forbidden. Beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community. All those who adhere to them. 
and all those who adhere to them. He adds another word in there, which I'll, I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But uh, a textbook definition in the 21st century will say something like religion is a belief in sacred powers believed to guide human destiny. That is what that is what a textbook definition, a, a belief in powers that guide human destiny. So it, it won't say uh, actually what do you guys think of religions? I'm, I just gave you one. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that sounds like a definition for magic too. Mm -hmm. Belief in powers that control. I was, just, I was, I was just going to move to that. We're going to move uh, that next. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I should have waited on that segment. And, and because and because you're instructor, I get to say this. Not even close. Okay. I get to say that. Fair um, enough. <laughs> sorry, just picking on. But no, no, no. In all seriousness, what what else? I mean, that's a good. That, that's good though. Magic and religion. There's definitely a connection there. Magic is the attempt to control nature by supernatural powers. Magic is not illusion. All right. Magic is not David Copperfield. Right. Magic is not, you know, pulling out the, the, the quarter from behind your ear or a rabbit out of a hat. That's illusion. I'm not good at card tricks. Um, my son, who's just turned 10, knows more card tricks than I do, and it, it's frustrating. But in all seriousness, uh, that's illusion. Magic is an attempt to control nature, either through, um, through a, a ritual or through some kind of practice where it is believed that a cause and if there is a cause and effect relationship religion on the other hand doesn't necessarily have that cause and effect relationship uh magic is necessarily individual because magic does not rely on any community for a specific event to occur the magician and in this case i mean the the, the person who's trying to cause an event to occur need not necessarily take place within a community typically a religious activity will take place within a community at least that's um, what a lot of theorists will say so what else what what else might be in a definition of religion what do you guys think faith who said it you did why why'd you use that word what does faith mean? You believe in something. What yeah. does that mean? Okay. Well, I, be I believe there's a table right there. Why is that not a religion? Because <laughs> so, I mean, I could make it into an altar. We could have human sacrifices here, um, but I still believe that's a table. How is that? What's the difference? Um, you have to believe in a greater being. Oh, a greater being. Okay. The table's not necessarily a greater being. Plus, the table's right in front of me, right? I can kick it. I can I can touch it. I can sit on it. Uh, but a greater being is something that's beyond my, beyond what? What is it? Beyond the physical world? Beyond, something beyond the physical, right? So religion oftentimes is something that's beyond what we can comprehend. That's what we try to push into, into religion. And like that, uh, that instructor from uh, Cal State Chico said, he says he doesn't know re what religion is and he doesn't care. Well, I think he does care because he teaches us stuff and so do I. But in all seriousness, we can't figure it out. As soon as we say, oh, no one, sa no one said religion has a God in it, belief in God, right? No one, no, no one ventured that guess, but maybe some of you are thinking it. Immediately we say, well, what about a religion that doesn't really have gods? And someone will say, what? Religion has to have a God. So immediately you're already dividing up. I taught a class with 20 students in it. And I said, we're going to have at least 25 different definitions of religion within the first week of class. We had 45. Because students change their minds within the first few weeks of, of that course. That's why I like teaching this stuff. Religions are messy. All right. So. Let's um, 
I want to talk just a bit because I want to get to sacred spaces and we've already gone, I don't even know how long, uh, 18 minutes or something. Um, the idea of, you know, I don't want to write on the board. It sounds so, it, it looks so weird here. I guess I should. Um, in religious studies, a lot of times you'll hear this. The church, sect, cult. And these, ter these terms, this is like the biggest, the biggest form of religious practice, the biggest group, so to speak. So a church... Not not this physical structure. So, uh, and then the sect will be a smaller group, and then a cult will be even a smaller group. The sect disagrees with what the church does, and then the cult is something very very new. Well, these terms have really loaded loaded uh, meanings behind them. Just to give it real quick, Durkheim uses the word church all the time. In 1912, he could get away with it. Today, we don't. As soon as you say it, what do you think of? When I say church, what what religion am I talking about? Christianity. Christianity. He wasn't. And most theorists weren't. They were trying to say religion. But they didn't want to use the word religion because they wanted to combine things. They, they, they wanted to be more academic in a way, I guess. So now when you see the term religion, Christianity, sect. Now we'll see the word denomination. Um, when I think of denomination, I think of dollar bills, but whatever. Um, domination. What's the denomination within the Christian church? Uh, Adventists. Adventist. What's another? Adventists. Baptists. Adventists. Catholics. Protestants. Jehovah's Witnesses. Whatever. You have a denomination which is a, which is a subset of this group. And there's necessarily a tension, a disagreement. There are different denominations. So within Islam, for example... You would have Sunni and Shia, which be, which is it? Are Sunni and Shia are they their own religion or are they a denomination? I'm not really sure. Within Judaism, you have um, uh, Reform Judaism, you have Liberal Judaism, you have different forms. Where is that a religion unto its own, or is it just a, a denomination? Well, none of them are really churches. None of them are really sex. They're certainly not cults because cult, now the term, has become new religious movement or NRM if you look it up. So I like to teach about new religious movements and we got a new course approved about magic, witchcraft, cults, and new religious movements. So that course has started this semester. Uh, I'm kind of excited about it myself. But when you hear the word cult, what do you think of? Somebody, anybody? What's that? I'm, I didn't hear you. Cults like uh, the ones you want to use. Sure. Uh, what do they do? Brainwashing. Brainwashing. Suicide cults, yeah. right? Everyone drinking the Kool Aid. Think of crazy stuff. Well, I mean, Islam was a cult when it began by definition it's not anymore today because it's you know, 1.6 billion people are are muslim in the world um there are three 2.9 or 3 billion christians in the world certainly wouldn't consider that a cult anymore because it's so big but when these new religious movements began that's what they were cult cult is, sh is short for culture it, just think of it as a subset within a culture. Um, when you have a culture, you always have somebody in there who disagrees with the main ideas of what's happening. So um, the reason I go, I wanted to go through this a little bit is to kind of give you a little bit of an idea about um, religious studies to let you know that it's not, well, it's not always clear. Religions are messy. Uh, one of the things that I really uh, enjoy showing, and I, I, I um, didn't uh, have it have it set up uh, just for today, but is to show uh, a, a graph. Um, it's a nice pew, pew religious uh, um, 
the Pew Center of uh, from the United States. They do surveys and they have this, uh, all the different religions that people claim to be. And it shows, you know, uh, I don't even know what it says. 50% are, are this form of Christianity and 25% are this and, and, and 10% are Buddhists and 3% are Jains and 1% are Jews and has all, and if you add up all the numbers, what number do you think you'd get? 100%, right? Not even close. It's like 112, right? Because people claim more than one. After living in Hawaii for two years, I remember when we first, my wife and I first moved there, I was, um, I got called Mr. Integrity by um, an instructor uh, there because he said, I said, well, how can a person claim to be two different Religions doesn't that doesn't that mean that 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 they're they're questioning their own integrity in some way or they're they're they've lost the integrity of one? And he laughed and he said, "I think you should read some of this and just think about what you're what you're doing." He said, "That's a good idea, but think about it." And then I met students um, in Hawaii, in in Japan, um, in other parts of the world, from other parts of the world, who go to a, go to a Pentecostal service on Sunday morning. Saturday night, they hit, they were at a Buddhist study center. All right, because their grandparents are Buddhist, but their parents are have converted in some way. And then, and then, in Hawaii, on a Wednesday night, they'll go to a heiau and sing Hawaiian songs about the creation of the universe. And I look at them, and they're not less of a person, they're just people. How can they believe in all this stuff? It's because religions are messy. That's why I like teaching it. That's why I do what I do. Now, let's turn the corner because I think, I think I'm going to get in trouble here for going over from uh, Professor Martin over here. You've got time. Uh, what's that? You've got time. All right. Okay. Sacred spaces. All right. Everyone here uh has probably thought i'm going to minimize this because the the, the only the, we go back to it we'll talk about um altered states of consciousness but let's talk a little bit about sacred spaces what's a sacred space yeah a place of worship a, place of worship, a house of worship okay it's a good example i'm not going to write these down i guess i could can i move this or just like Oh yeah, you can move back. All right. What's a house of worship? Give me an example. Uh, a church, a mosque, church, mosque. I heard something else. Synagogue. Synagogue. Okay. Something other than a house of worship that's a sacred space. Yeah. Okay. Well, Mecca is a is a definitely a place of worship. Okay. Um, an altar. Altar. There you go. Now we're getting smaller. Okay. I'm not sure what the actually but Muslims are wearing prayer carpet. Yeah, prayer carpet. Yeah. Um. Direction them too, because we're going with that. They they pray east, don't they, or towards their yeah. The cardinal directions are often north, south, east, west are often considered sacred at different times of the year. Yeah. Um, could the sacred space be more like the metaphorical aspect, um, like? Someone's like mind. Yeah. Mind space. Okay. I mean, we talk, we, we, we see science fiction movies, right? Where someone's mind gets altered and they're not them anymore. What's sacred about that? Um, it's, it's basically like it's you. So it's, um, a space where you can be free and yeah, you're already starting to make the leap from alter to altered states of consciousness. I don't want to go too far down that road, but we can see it, we can see it where we're going to go. But 
I want to talk about sacred spaces because um, the reason that I brought up Durkheim and about his uni unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, he says, one single moral community called a church and all those who adhere to them. The second element, the church, this, this, this community finds a place in our definition is no less essential than the first. So that system is no less important than the society. For by showing that the idea of religion is inseparable from that of church or the community, makes it clear that religion should be an eminently collective thing. For Durkheim in 1912, and this shaped really what organized religion, uh, how we study it and how people think about religion. I'm not saying he's right or wrong, what I'm saying is it shaped how we think about religion because he said religion is collective. So when we talk about a sacred space, he goes, he just turns up the dial all the way and says, you know what? You know what most the most sacred thing is? Is society. It's supposed to be the earth, by the way. Um, so what we do in a society is we find the center point and has anyone seen this term, axis mundi? What does it mean, somebody? What's this word mean, axis? What's an axis? There you go. The, 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 the axis, something that you spin around. So what's mundi? World, the center of the world. What were you going to? Same thing. Center of the world, yeah. So um, what a lot of theorists, these early theorists did, and it's sort of like, this is, this is where it seems magical, but in this sense, I mean, like out of nowhere, not necessarily the academic version of magical, but just pops out of nowhere, is that they just, boop, axis mundi, that's the center of the universe. And therefore it must be religion. So now I'm gonna make a, 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 a telling sort of joke about um, I saw it over there about archaeology, and I, I'm sure you guys have studied anthropology and, and other um, in history. And you, you look at studying a particular culture. Whenever a particular culture is studied, there's two things that you can be sure of. And um, it's a sort of tongue in cheek, but there is a lot of truth to this. One, you're going to find stuff in that culture that you just don't can't figure out where it goes, can't figure out what it is. You find an object, you find a, an instrument, you find, you find a cup, oh, they must have drank out of that. You find uh, uh, tools, oh, they, they made things out of it. Oh, a table, they sat next to it and ate with it. Oh, you find um, a building, oh, that's where they gathered. Um, you find a bed, that's what they slept on. And then you'll find something. It just seems to have no practical purpose. It must be religious. That's where we go right away. Must, must have a spiritual purpose. It must have some metaphysical purpose. Points us to the great beyond. Points us to this idea of connecting to the universe. And the other thing is interesting about a society is that now I'll we'll pretend whenever you have a city, not necessarily just the whole the whole world, but a city. You almost always have center city, right? Center of the town. What's often at the center of the town? What uh, what's in the center of Los Angeles? What's that? Downtown. Downtown, yeah. What's there? Not downtown LA. What's what's there? Mayor's office. Good one. What else? Library. Library. Okay. Put all the books there. Financial institution. Financial institution. The banks. How about Union Station? Right? That's where you come in. The center is always where the most activity takes place. Now, in modern society, in 21st century America, for example, we're not going to find, or will we, 
houses of worship. We're not going to find these types of houses of worship. We're going to find perhaps different houses of worship. And this is where our definition of religion might go sideways on us if, if, we, if we think in different ways. Uh, in downtown San Diego, for example, they built a baseball stadium. In Los Angeles, for example, Dodger Stadium is pretty darn close to Center City. Um, I'm not saying baseball is a religion, but I am saying that's what's important to society today. So it depends how we define religion. I'm going to push that. I'm going to push that metaphor a little bit because I believe Durkheim would. Um, we have rituals. We have a sacred space. Have you ever gone? Has anyone gone to a professional sports game like baseball, football, anything? All right. Did when you were in the stands, did you try to jump and run on the field? No. Did you? Why not? I mean, don't you want to play football with it the, with them? I mean, that'd be cool, right? You go to a Rams game or what was it? No, it was the Dodgers. Dodgers? Yeah. I mean, you go out and give Mookie Betts a hug. I mean, you know, hey, how you doing? I mean, wouldn't that be cool? Would you get stopped by security then? Yeah. Why, why would you get stopped by security? They don't want you on the field. They don't want you on Why don't they want you on the field? It's rude. It's rude? <laughs> it interrupts the game. It interrupts the game? Or it is a sacred space because it's set apart. That's... If you take the definition of religion and push it to make it so big, anything becomes a religion. Brushing your teeth five minutes before you go to bed becomes a religion for some people, or they believe that it is. I'm not sure if I'm ready to go that far. But um, if you watch baseball players, um, when they run in or run across the field, watch. They never run across that pitcher's mound. That pitcher's mound is a sacred space. Only the pitcher goes on it and the grounds crew who's cleaning it up. The outfielders who come in, they never run right across that dirt. Never. That white line, the first and third base lines, very few, very few times will you see someone step on that line who's not actually running down the base path. It's sacred in a way. That's the, does it mean, does anybody in here think baseball is a religion? I usually get somebody right away. How about football? Oh yeah. I had, I had this, uh, I had a, a, an older student yell, Notre Dame. Whoa. Um, went a little crazy on me. Uh, but I mean, in all seriousness, it happens. My brother has, is my brother is 57 years old. Since he's been 18 years old, I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. Since he's been 18, he has missed three, three Florida State football games. One, he was, uh, he had kidney stones. I'm not, I'm, I'm not kidding. I know. One, my other brother got married. And the other one, my mom died. Those are the three times he missed the Florida State football game. Home, away, and bowl games, if you know anything about college football. Three in just about 40 years. If that's not a religion, I'm not sure what exactly is. <laughs> he won't miss it. And I think that we need to broaden that a little bit. All right. Questions on sacred spaces, because I, I want to give, give you guys a little bit, a little taste of, um, yeah, of altered states, if I can get to it. Um, this is a, uh, sorry, this is, I, I just brought this up as quick as I could. I, the only reason I brought this up is for the videos, not because I'm instructing you guys in, in, a, in shamanism, a case study. Um, but when I teach uh, a course on magic, witchcraft, in religion, I go through shamanism and I teach about altered states of consciousness because for what a shaman does, 
um, across various world traditions, uh, from Siberian and Korean shamanism to uh, North American and South American shamanism, uh, is contact the spirit world. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions on it's always a dead person. Maybe. Uh, there's a lot of misconception that it's always some god. Maybe. Uh, in Nepalese shamanism, uh, the man I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about here is Kedar Baral. And uh, for those, actually, I could I should have brought this up if I could have. I have a, um, um, I will, I have copies of, of this and uh, I'll, I brought some. I was able to meet um, Kedar Baral uh, year, a few years ago, and um, he's quite a character. Uh, he looks very serious here, uh, but he lives in Nepal and travels all over the world, uh, teaching others his techniques. Um, in Nepal, uh, shamanism is sort of looked at as different. Um, People who practice shamanism are generally considered a little dangerous, not necessarily because they're going to do something bad, but because they have contact with the spiritual world or claim to. Um, those who actually do uh, have contact are tested. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Baral in, in 2005, uh, was contacted by authorities because someone said we, they saw him at the scene of a crime. And he said, yeah, I was there because I came outside and I wanted to see if I could help. And long convoluted, strange story. Uh, he was arrested by the Nepalese government. And while in prison, uh, while in jail, I should say, he wasn't really put in prison. It was just a couple of days in jail, he was held. Um, he was able to explain past crimes to them and locate some uh, a murder weapon that had been lost in a crime that took place decades before, before he was even born. So they thought, well, it seems that he, he has a connection to the spirit world and he's, he's able to divine things. So we're going to test him a little more. And they did. And somehow, some way, he helped them figure out who committed some uh, treason, treason against the Nepalese government. So needless to say, he was released. He was praised. And he began uh, what's now known as Ashram Nepal. Uh, so most shamans that are of the type that he is, he's a, a jankri, a bon jankri. It's a particular type of shaman who gets, uh, and it's, it, it's a it's a it's a odd practice, but this is what they do. They kidnap a child. It's all done by family members, but they take the child, they put a hood over them, and they take them out to the woods for about three months when they're little, and they scare the living daylights out. This is common in shamanism. This happens in uh, in uh, in Kumari in uh, when they try to figure out who who can speak to goddess and they do this with young young girls four or five six years old and they show them scary images and see how much they freak out and they terrify and, and this is what happened to to Baral uh, now the difference with Baral is his parents were Brahmins were a high caste of priests generally Banjankri are either have no caste or are of a, or, or a lower caste and are generally very poor. His parents, while they weren't in exceedingly wealthy, they, they weren't farmers. They weren't lived out in, in the middle of nowhere. They lived in Kathmandu, in the middle of the city. But he was still believed to have this power. So they take him out and, and, uh, and, he, and he sleeps in a cave, uh, as he said, for three months, four months. And as the story goes, in real life, in real life, it's legend. It's we don't know how much is 100 percent true. You know, it's a lot of this is legend and 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 
uh, he scared his family members by knowing about their lives at age nine. He was foretelling all of the ill-gotten deeds that they did for their whole life that he knew he had this secret knowledge. So when he came back, they proclaimed him as a Bon Jonker, which is very unusual for someone of his cast and someone in his life. Now, in this photo, he's about 30 something. Let me see. This was in, this was in 13 years ago. Yeah, 30. He's about 45 now. He would have been about 32 back then. He was very young um, and still from a young age, he continued this, um, this interesting life. Now, when I uh, talked to him uh, on Skype um, about, oh boy, well, this was published in 2010. I think I talked to him in 2008, 2009. And I talked to him a few times after this as well. Um, I don't know Nepalese and his English was was not very great. So my uh, professor, Deepak Shankara, and I spoke with him and this guy was just a character. Um, so I asked him point blank. I said, how is it to you heal people? And he started and through the translation, he starts laughing and he says, I, I don't know how to heal people. I said, well, that's what you do. I mean, you, you heal people come to you. And they're they're and they seek your healing. And he, it was a lot of mistranslation, and we finally figured it out. He views healing as if you have a broken leg, that needs to be healed. Everything else is just part of life. He he said, I just guide people to be to find their path. I don't really heal them, I just point them in a direction and they. They either go or they don't. Um, he said, I don't heal people. When someone comes to me and says, I have a broken leg, I, I, I look at them. And this was, this was really funny. I said, and uh, in English, he says, I look, look, I say, go doctor. Go doctor. Broke leg, go doctor. I'm not going to heal that. Um, and so, so immediately my, th my thought is, okay, spiritual mental, uh, perhaps psychosomatic, you know, something like that. And as a, a Western person, as an American person, I don't really, it's hard to figure him out. Um, and what, the, way that he, the way that he tried to heal people was simply point them in a certain direction and say, go, just live. And so in this or in the article that, that we uh, we wrote, um, I, I write about his. Uh, he has a uh, the the jangro, the, the certain type of drum, and he's beating it. And he does does all these different sort of rituals, and I talked to them talked to him about that. And when we watch the video here, you'll notice if I can keep picking up the wrong mouse. Uh, if we watch the video here. He is not. Um, there's no, there's no he's in some nice Repetitively calling upon Shiva uh, to get to get Shiva to come and help, and help him communicate with the other guy. Right. This isn't the 
Unlike other shamans, Gaurav's goal is not to keep this, this knowledge for himself and heal. He wants to teach other people. Um, and in 2010, he had over 100 disciples, people that he trained in the uh, people that were not kidnapped as children, people that didn't work He thinks he can give the children this knowledge on his own, which is very new, very different. He's entering an altered states of consciousness here, not through anything other than his own action. He's not using any type of hallucinogenic On Skype, I had one more conversation. I said, so we don't, we don't I mean, funny, but you know, it's just, it just, you know, like, it doesn't, it doesn't ring, you know what I mean? You expect the show to be like, this wise sage, or the cave, or something, you know, it's just a regular dude who likes his soccer. So he's trying to modernize. If we go to the next one, as I say, we seem to be red, or rather agitated state. He begins in a more controlled way, but then he starts to bounce. Now he brings some incense here. Right. Here he jumps up. Look at his disciple. Now his disciple is starting to chant. It's un, it's uncontrolled. It's not. He's not saying any, any, any words. This gentleman can. Um, but we can see here, he, at one point, he did this word, he can see him. He never wants to understand it. He doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't know what's happening. They start talking.
all these people and just the, you know, I don't know if this is ritualistic, but they're, the way that they're meditating and what they're doing is like just what you can. What do you think the disciple is? I don't know. I don't know how to ask the question, but what do you think is going through his mind? I think he's trying to connect. Yeah. Connect to what? To uh, his teacher. Okay. Well, Baral wants him, doesn't doesn't want him to connect just to him. He wants him to connect to, to the Adi Guru, the, the, uh, the, the, the great god Shiva. Um, yeah. Tell me, you had your hand. Um, I feel like I was trying to imagine myself being there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if the video is just him doing his thing. It's the different video to show they had a conversation before, like he said, I'm going to do this. And, mm -hmm. you know, so you watch out for this feeling and watch out for this. So I don't know. But if I were, um, if I was the, um, the disciple, like I'm the disciple. I feel like I'd be kind of um, a little afraid because it would almost be like I was alone. Yeah. I have to, even though um, the shaman's waking. Yeah. It's like, it's like, oh, they're connecting to each other and then trying to connect to something about them. It's like, yeah. he's finding it in himself. And like, if I, if I were him, I'd be afraid because it's like, Almost like I'm going on the journey alone. Yeah. He's like, he doesn't know what's going on. Like, you can see it, you can use. One so thing, it that's it. Yeah. It, it, one of the things that uh, I don't have videos of it and Brawl wouldn't allow it, but he came to Texas, uh, Texas, New York, and a few other places in the United States um, and had American folks who don't know Nepalese, who don't know even how to pronounce. Adi Guru or any other words uh, in Sanskrit or, or in Nepalese, sit with them and they would begin to um, according to, to him and according to the, he wouldn't, he wouldn't allow recordings of it. I asked him for it and that was the only time he got angry on Skype. Uh, like th actually threatened me to end the Skype call and I'm like Help Deepak, like I don't want to end. What did I do? I upset the man, you know, uh, because the um, he had a woman, according to what the witnesses said, she started just Sanskrit, just spewing out all this stuff. And he's like, oh, yes, that was Sanskrit. And then in Nepalese, in his own native tongue. And, you know, to the casual observer, we could say, well, she was just repeating the words that he was saying and you could go there. But uh, she admitted to being fully unconscious uh, when she was in, in this kind of state. Now, this man um, who, who he allowed to do it was someone who, he's, who had become one of those uh, trusted disciples in Nepal. Uh, for the life of me, I can't remember his name right now. It's in my somewhere. Uh, anyway, um, and he's already beginning to teach others how to do this. Uh, why is that physical agitation so necessary? I feel like it's uh, it could be seen as like a what's the word? Like, oh, I don't believe it, or it's kind of offensive to what he believes. I feel like that yeah. could be the case. Taking yeah. offense. What do you mean? He's. No, oh, could you say, because he said, why. He... No, 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 no. I mean, no, I mean, why is this agitated? Why is he like the, the disciple? I mean, you see him, you see, I mean, he, you watch them. I mean. Stop. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. The shoulders, the, it's not just the hands, I mean, the whole head, it's not just the not just the rock. Um, they're not physically touching. Um, he always said that too, he said it was important for him not to touch the person. Um, grab them or something like that. Um, 
the guru to, 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 to come in to come in direct contact, not not through his physical touch. Um, I think I'm way over time here, but uh, why? Yeah, you, is, you uh, anything else? Last comments or anything? No, no. I think you. I, I know. I just wanted to ask. Wanted to see if you guys had any questions, but um, yeah. But um, I have experience with talking to like, shamans and a few different people, and they try to connect, not only really connect with me, yeah. but almost like have me connect to myself. Yeah. But honestly, I'm I'm a very like kind of closed off person. So when people try to talk to me, I'm like they talk to my siblings and my mom, and then they would feel something or they would experience something. Sure. But it's because they they're kind of open to it. Yeah. So I feel like with these things from when there's someone there that's meant to guide you or meant to teach you something or help you like a shaman, someone's trying to teach you something and share something with you. Um, I feel like you see the person getting agitated or you see that they're having some reaction when they're open to the Yeah. You know, when, when they find that place in themselves, like they're ready to open themselves. Yeah, that, but if that, not, then then they're not going to feel anything. Yeah, that's one of the things that that I think that Baral really was was uh, uh, adamant about was that he never forces this upon anyone because I mean, you could you could see how you know, yeah you're sitting in a circle with me and I'm going to dance around you and uh, do this kind of stuff. Um, it could be you know intimidating, scary. Um, and I think he he wanted he only wanted to do this with with folks who are open to it and open to really feeling that connection. Um, in this case, this is like the I, don't, I can't remember how many times he sat with this particular disciple, but quite a few, to where he felt like I mean this guy he I think he said he sat with him and did this where the guy did nothing like six times, you know, for over a period of a month. Just he didn't, and then one day he just did this and connected. And now he's, you know, his own, um, a shaman unto his own. So, yeah, I, but he, this guy really, really wanted it. And I guess he, I remember Brawl saying something to the effect like he was trying too hard <laughs> at first. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, do you need <laughs> I got asked that question all the time. I think Baral serves a need um, for people who go, uh, who need something beyond Western or beyond traditional medicine. Uh, whether or not I think he actually heals people, um, it depends what's meant by healing. I think he points people in the right direction and I think they listen to him. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of shamans out there who, who do good. Um, I don't. I don't think he's uh, doing anything. Uh, I don't think he's a charlatan. I guess is the best word I can say. Just one more. I, I think I want to give Professor Martin time. Yeah. Do you think do you think it is kind of shamanism? Do you think it's uh, it's kind of that kind of therapy? Do you see it as kind of therapy? Yeah, I think that's exactly what he. That's exactly how he views uh, what he's doing. Um, the Bon Jankri is meant as a guide and not necessarily just a, a lot of traditional shamans will be a wounded healer. They'll have, they'll take pain onto themselves. And he, I mean, this guy surfs, you know, he, he skis, he's physically active. He's like, I, I want people to, to, to embrace life and not to, and it, it, so, you know, I don't think he's Tony Robbins, you know, the self-help guy. Uh, but I think his goal is to help others and not just um, and provide kind of an outlet. You know, and it's a good way of putting it. All right, so I'll close these and let you guys switch chairs with me. Certainly. Oh, you want that? Thank you very much. Uh, All right. Uh, Great. A special thanks to Dr. Pei for joining us and for his comments.
Um, I don't have the experience he has in lecturing on this topic. In fact, this is the first time I've ever spoken in public about this topic. So I'm going to rely a little bit more on my notes than he did. Uh, so I hope you'll bear with me uh, when it comes to that. If you could peer into time and space and focus the vision of your mind's eye on a young citizen of Athens, Greece, exactly 2,500 years ago today, you might see someone getting ready for what would undoubtedly, undoubtedly be the most significant spiritual experience of their lifetime. You see, the date would be as it is now, September 20th. And three days from this date is the fall equinox, when the earth starts tilting away from the sun and the nights get colder and darker. After the last of the harvests, life won't return to the fields until the next spring. For most of us in our technologically advanced society, the equinoxes go unnoticed. But to our young Greek citizen from an ancient agrarian civilization, the equinoxes are of the utmost importance. When your life depends on the success of the harvest, tracking the seasons becomes critical. But there's a deeper metaphor here too. Equinoxes are important liminal markers between what the seasons represent, warmth and cold, light and darkness, even life and death. The fall equinox was especially significant for the Greeks because it represents the transition toward the mystery of death and the afterlife. It's entirely appropriate, therefore, that this be the season for the Kikion or Kukion ritual to be administered by the mystery school of Demeter. But before we go any further, let me confess something. First, I have to say it feels slightly quixotic to study a pharmacological secret wrapped in a pagan mystery. By definition, these topics were kept from outsiders, which raises the question of whether an outsider should even be seeking the answers to these questions in the first place. In fact, I hesitated to even include this topic in our Kalmyka curriculum. There are simply too many unknowns about the potion and associated ri uh, ritual. I had similar concerns about the Indo-Aryan drink Soma, which I ended up not including in our study of ethnobotany. In the end, I decided that De uh, Demeter's Kikion or Kukion is valuable for its many knowns and not its many unknowns. So maybe let's set aside our doubts and let's not worry too much about what we don't know. And let's start with what we do know about this topic. First, the Kukion was an ancient potion consumed during a ritual on the fall equinox in the temple of Demeter in the Greek city of Eleusis. This ritual is known today as the Eleusinian Mysteries, and it belongs to a greater complex of Greek mystery schools, for example, those of the cult of Persephone and Dionysus. But without a doubt, the Eleusinian Mysteries were the most prominent and prestigious initiation rite of the Greek world for nearly 2,000 years. Kukion means mixture in ancient Greek. Even though its exact nature was protected by an oath of secrecy, with a penalty of death, of death attached to it, several different recipes have been handed down to us through medical treatises, the Homeric hymns, and, so, and several comic satires. The most consistent ingredients were barley, water, but there were also other ingredients like mint or grated cheese or penny royal, and even in some cases, wine. An active psychedelic substance has yet to be accepted by the entire academic community, but there are some interesting hypotheses that we'll discuss shortly. If we get back to our young Greek citizen in the fifth century BC, we might find him preparing to travel the 15 miles to Eleusis. On foot, it wouldn't take him more than one day to make the trip. He would have passed by numerous important landmarks as he traveled along what was to become known as the Sacred Way. He probably stopped at multiple temples, shrines, or watering wells along the way. As he neared the sacred city and the sacred site, his anticipation and excitement grew as he contemplated what the first century BC Roman order and statesman Cicero called the most exceptional and divine thing that Athens has ever produced. And that's a pretty remarkable statement considering Greece is the birthplace of democratic republics and philosophy and medical treatises used for 2000 years. Our young initiate grew up in a culture 
where being initiated into a mystery school was the greatest spiritual experience a Greek citizen could have. Undoubtedly, most of his adult relatives had also been initiated. In psychedelic terms, this is a carefully crafted cultural set and setting for an orchestrated experience that relied on altered states of consciousness to attain a specific experiential outcome. Aristotle said, initiates came to Eleusis not to learn something, but to experience something. Of course, we don't know the full extent of what initiates experienced, but let's go back to the things that we know. At Athens, the festival of the harvest lasted about 10 days with Demeter's ritual at its heart. Up to several thousand initiates, initiates traveled to Eleusis each year to participate. Arriving after dark, they were received by groups of citizens of Eleusis that jeered and taunted uh, the, the, the arriving initiates. This type of reception was intended to imprint on the minds the serious and solemn nature of the, of the occasion and their undertaking. Their pathway would have been illuminated by hundreds of torches as they walked toward the temple of Demeter. The event at Eleusis would have lasted several days and involved numerous rituals and metaphoric activities. One of the requirements was that initiates fast for 24 hours. The fast was then broken by consuming this potion, the kukion, which was followed by the principal theatric representations of the festival, which most likely was a telling or retelling of the mythical story of Demeter and Persephone. Demeter was the sister of Zeus. She was the goddess of the harvest and was responsible for teaching humans the secrets of agriculture. With the help of Zeus, she gave birth to a beautiful daughter, Persephone, who quickly caught the eye of Hades in the underworld. After consulting with Zeus, Hades planned to kidnap Persephone and make her his queen. One day, while Persephone was painting the flowers of the field, Hades appeared out of nowhere and abducted her, carrying her, her off to his underworld kingdom on the other side of the river Styx. When Demeter realized her daughter was missing, she was distraught and searched everywhere for her in vain. As the goddess of agriculture, the harvest, and nature's fertility, Demeter had the power to cause a drought to come upon the land. Whether out of anger, grief, or as a way to try to recover her daughter, Demeter caused the crops and the plants to dry up and die. Starvation and death followed in her wake. The land was barren, and there were no first fruits to offer the gods. Many people died, and humanity lifted their voices in supplication to ease their suffering. In response, the sun god, who sees all from his lofty perch in the heavens, revealed the truth of Persephone's disappearance and told Demeter that she was being held in the underworld by Hades. Demeter appealed to Zeus for help, and he convinced Hades to release Persephone back to Earth. But before doing so, Hades gifted Persephone seeds from a pom pomegranate to eat during her voyage. This was actually a trick, and having eaten from the fruit of the underworld, she was forced to live there as his queen every year during the cold months of the, of the season. This mythological account of the significance of the seasons has deep metaphoric implications for the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. It reveals humanity's deep-seated fear of the uncertainty and finality of death. But it also is the source of hope for a future. The power of the Kukion and its associated ritual is that it promotes visions that banish all fear of death. At St. Paul's Monastery in Athos, Greek, in, in, in Athos, Greece, there is a saying that is emblazoned on the wall of the reception area. The English translation reads, if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. This saying seems to have been pressed into service by the Christian community because it dovetails quite nicely with the teachings of Jesus found in the book of John. 
But before we get to that, let me say a few words just in case you're starting to feel uncomfortable about comparisons between a possible mind-altering drug of ancient pagan harvest rituals and some of the most holy scriptures in Christendom. Remember that the New Testament has close connections to the Greek world. For instance, the first lines of the gospel according to John declare, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In English, the use of the word doesn't mean as much as it does in the original Greek, where the author was relying on an established concept from Greek philosophy. In the original Greek, the word logos is used. In other words, in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. To put it into oversimplified language, God seems to be here, according to the Greek idea and the adaptation by the Christians, the rational motivating and organizing force of the universe. Going back to our idea of overcoming death, in John chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. To put it into less repetitive terms, if you enjoy the spiritual rebirth of baptism, you can receive eternal life after death. It's interesting to note that Spanish chroniclers in the 16th century reported that the Aztecs enjoyed similar benefits after consuming psilocybin mushrooms and morning glory seeds, which contain the same substance as is proposed of the Greek kukion. After eating teonanakat, for example, warriors lost all fear of death and were able to face their enemy with tremendous bravery. When Aztec priests covered their body with a psychedelic ointment called oleoluki, they felt emboldened to face the threats of difficult nighttime sacrifices in dangerous locations. In modern times, consumers of psychedelics report ego death, where it feels like their soul or consciousness merges with some greater universal spiritual energy. Those suffering from end-of-life anxiety due to terminal conditions and diagnoses report experience a calming peace that indicates to them the continuation of the soul's existence after passing through and beyond this veil of tears. Many report that their anxiety in the face of their own mortality has dissolved after a powerful psychedelic experience. Sometimes psychedelics, even edible marijuana, can occasion a bad trip with the panic and, and anxiety of imminent doom. Visions of death and destruction will swirl around your mind, images of a thousand bad things that could happen. With recent marijuana legalization, there have been numerous accounts of overdosing on edibles that leave the individual certain that they were dying or going to die. Experienced trippers know that the best way to react to these dark thoughts is to stop fighting them and to let them go and to let happen whatever is going to happen. In the moment of recognition and acceptance of our own mortality and the inevitability of our future, uh, uh, of our future a tremendous power is achieved, and the so-called bad trip usually changes quality for the better. When it comes to Eleusis, the general idea is that it was a face-to-face -face meeting with the, initiative, with the in, in, initiate's own mortality, accompanied by the revelation of the eternal and divine nature of the human soul. This realization and the accompanying return to life can have a dramatic impression on the human experience. It was commonly said that if you come to Eleusis, you will never die. The initiation at Eleusis is a masterclass on set and setting, important topics when it comes to psychedelic studies. Not only did initiates live in a culture that supported and promoted the consumption of a sacramental potion, they experienced it in a way that had been planned and prepared for a specific outcome. On a mystical and psychological level, set and setting with these substances is paramount. The first to promote this idea was Timothy Leary, who basically, uh, and it's been furthered by others like Stanislav Grof, who calls psychedelics non-specific amplifiers. In other words, whatever you bring to the game will be increased by these substances. Proper set and setting applies to most of the plants that we study in this club, but, but particularly with the classic psychedelics like LSA, LSD, psilocybin, and mescaline. Set is your mindset. What are your intentions? 
What is your emotional and psychological condition? It should be as close to normal as possible. Individuals suffering from psychological distress should be extremely cautious when working with these substances as they can send you spiraling into a nosedive of negative thought loops. Setting is our environment. It should be neutral, tending toward the positive. Being in an unusual or unsure environment with real or perceived threats can cause tremendous psychological stress. In the end, the greater your physical, mental, and spiritual preparation, the greater your chances of success with any given plant that you're working with. Going back to Greece, Aristotle said that initiates come to Eleusis. Oh, I guess I already <laughs> said that. Come to Eleusis not to learn something, but to experience something. This whole idea of it being a mystery school is this idea that you're actually learning by being there, but it's not so much a learning by hearing something, it's a learning by experiencing it. It seems pretty clear that our young, Greeks, our young Greek initiates ex expectation would be to gain sight that makes all other sight like blindness. This sounds to me a lot like Aldous Huxley's famous description of his experience with peyote in the doors of perception. He says, in the final stage of egolessness, there is an obscure knowledge that all is in all, that all is actually each. This is as near, I take it, as a finite mind can ever come to perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. This type of experiential knowledge is distinct from learning facts and information, and in fact, in ancient Greek, enjoys its own verb, gnosis. As a professor of Spanish, I should point out that this is the origin of the two Spanish verbs meaning to know, saber and conocer. Saber is knowing facts and information, and conocer from the word gnosis means information or knowledge through personal experience. But what exactly were the initiates seeing? Professor Carl Ruck says the answer has to be nothing less than a face-to-face -face meeting with Persephone herself who revealed the secrets that she experienced, her own descent and death to the underworld and her subsequent return to life on earth. Like the effects that people have after a near-death experience, the Greek initiate would return to life with a renewed appreciation for their own mortality and existence. In psychedelic terms, this is the famous afterglow. That was noted by Dr. Albert Hoffman, the discoverer of LSD-25 after the first intentional ingestion of the drug in the 1940s. Admittedly, he had a difficult first trip riding his bicycle home from the laboratory. But the next morning, as he walked out into his garden, it seemed like he was looking at the world anew, with wonder, as if through fresh eyes. This leads us to the most speculative part of today's lesson, ingredients. But with everything we've talked about regarding ritual, sacred space, and time, set and setting, we shouldn't feel too bad about not knowing with certainty what it was that initiates were actually consuming during this ritual. There is great debate about active ingredients. Some academics believe that the vision-inducing experience was the result of placebo. Or say, in other words, pure culture and environment and pre-programming. That's to say the cultural and theatrical structure were sufficient to allow initiates the ability to achieve an altered state of consciousness without any chemicals. But other scholars like Carl Ruck, Albert Hoffman, R. Gordon Wasson, and Brian Murorescu make a compelling case that the active ingredient is actually the parasitic grain fungus ergot, scientific name Clauceps purpurea. This is the famous cause of St. Anthony's fire, a condition that came from eating infected rye grains and resulted in the putrefaction of the limbs and insane visions of hellfire and damnation in medieval Europe. It is also the starting point for the eventual discovery of LSD-25. Because St. Anthony's fire, ergot, and the discovery of LSD will be the topic of one of our lessons next semester, I'm not going to get into that right now, unfortunately. Um, 
the Eleusinian mysteries are going to have to remain somewhat mysterious to us for now, but maybe that's not a bad thing. I do have a few comments real quick on some of the things that Dr. Uh, Pave was talking about. In particular, I really appreciated his idea of sacredness and what it means to be sacred. This idea of, of it being a separate thing, of, of something being separated from uh, other common buildings, other people or groups, etc. And we can really see that in this ritual at Eleusis. First and foremost, the location has been separated, separate from Athens in a small city located 15 miles from Athens. In the city, there's a temple. And so we're kind of going into these, again, kind of like ru those Russian nesting dolls. We keep going smaller and smaller and smaller. Within the city, there's the Temple of Demeter. Within the Temple of Demeter, there's the Holy of Holies, if you will. And so there's this idea of separate spaces separated from uh, the rest of us. And there's also this idea of the initiates by themselves, separating themselves from Athens, going to a particular place, they seem to also be making themselves sacred in doing that. And obviously with the Kukion, this mysterious recipe for a potion that uh, in certain ways it was, uh, in fact, it was illegal to prepare this potion and consume this potion outside of the temple of Demeter um, on different dates. And so I think I had I think I've got a note here that there was one guy in particular in the year 415, uh, Alcibiades, who was charged with providing the Kukion to individuals at his own house, and he was prosecuted, and I'm not exactly sure what the result of that was. But there's this idea that the potion itself has been separated from us and is unattainable except on a specific day at a specific uh, place. Um, that's all of my prepared comments. We're, we're up right about 2.30. And so if there are any quick questions, we'll entertain any last comments or questions. Uh, but if not, then we're going to uh, we're going to end on this note. Please. Um, you're talking about the location of the important and sacredness of the Kukion, right? And then you mentioned the, the quote-unquote symbol effect and how it's a good message. And at the, at the end, just right now, you said uh, the guy who carried on home. You think the people who I said what on the last? The people yes. Yeah, so it right if if you do consider that this is all placebo effect, you would have to say that the experience would be entirely different. There's absolutely no way for us to know it that I'm aware of uh, what their experience was. But I think that might be a good argument for the fact that there was some active chemical in there that was uh, aiding in the production of the of the visions. Yeah, but very interesting. Did you have something, Lucia? Any other comments, guys? Yeah. Have you read the, the one you said to me? I have not. I, I, I was just looking at it. I've read it. I just, I just, I, I knew I could find the perception. And uh, it, it's funny because it says Metanira offered her Demeter a cup, having filled it with honey sweet wine, but she refused, saying it was not divinely ordained that she not drink red wine. Uh, and I remember something like she doesn't want the honey sweet, but she wants red wine. So they didn't have any red wine, apparently. So uh, Demeter ordered her, uh, Metanira, to mix some barley and water with delicate penny oil, you mentioned, and to give her the meter that potion to drink. So it, it was like, I, I, I don't worry, I think it was because in the informer's home, because she didn't have red wine, they like made this and it looked like red wine, but it was, it was that, I don't know. I thought you might- So it, that, that, that kind of sounds like you're implying that they tricked her and gave her a, no. and drugged her. No, no, no. She okay, yeah. Her, she was ordered. We don't have that. Like this, make she right. ordered her to make this. Yeah, yeah. She so prefers she the barley wine. Made the cookie on. Yeah. And offered it to the gods just as she had ordered. Yeah. Uh, Very clear. The key about barley is that the parasite grows on the barley. Yeah. And so you're not going to get the psychedelic effects of just wine. Yeah. But you would get it with the barley. Yeah. Um, also, another idea with wine is that uh, according to, it sounds like a common practice of the time was that wine isn't 
wine for the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, isn't like wine as we know it today. It was almost always, there was almost always admixtures, other things inside of there. So any kind of, um, you know, henbanes or mandrakes or deturas or any other type of um, plant usually that, that will give it an added kick, if you will. And so, and there are a bunch of interesting kind of um, parallels with early Christianity and the sacraments of the wine and eating the bread and um, lots of interesting parallels there. And in fact, early fathers of the, of the Catholic church called the host, called the Eucharist, they called it, um, what, let me look it up real quick, just so I have it. Uh, they called it the, no, I don't see it here. Um, they called it, well, I'll have to come back to that. We'll have to address this next time, I think, because we're kind of running out of time here. Oh, they called it the pharmacon, right? And so this is St. Ignatius of Antioch. He called it the pharmacon Athanasius. And pharmacon, the word is, it gives us pharmacology and pharmacist, and it can be used as either drug or as some kind of a, a potion, a, um, a cure, if you will. In other words, the magic, the potion is in the dose. And so you take too much of this, it can be bad for you, it can cause you harm. You take just the right amount and it can heal you. And so it's kind of this interesting idea that, that the body of Christ and for the early church is being described as a pharmacon, which is really interesting. And unfortunately, I've got class coming up here. And so um, uh, I think that's it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks online, guys. Nick uh, and Celeste and Linda, I think, was there as well. Um, we have a couple of upcoming events. Next week, next Wednesday, is a regular club meeting. We'll be talking about business. And then the following week, which is, I don't have it here. It's, uh, what date would that be? The following Wednesday is the, the fourth. The fourth is our next plant uh, lecture, which is going to be on the Sonoran Desert Toad, even though it's not a plant. All right. Thank you guys so much for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, I put copies of the, the book chapter over there about Carol Burrell, if you're interested.